Hey, what's up guys? Today I am going to be reviewing my 2018 Kawasaki Versus X300. Now I've had this bike for a year by now. I bought this back in the late portion of 2018. Now it's the middle of 2019, July 2019 in fact. Almost a year, almost a year. Uh, and during this period of time, I haven't really done any major mod modifications to my X300. It's 100% stock. Everything you see here, with, uh, with ex the exception of course the top case, everything you see here including the side boxes and the these hand guards over here, they're all 100% stock. They all came like this from the uh, dealer. So I'm going to be uh, talking about this X300, how I feel about it over the course of a one year period and then uh, I'll let you guys decide whether it's a good bike or not as how my reviews usually go. Now with all my bike reviews I usually will start with the first thing rideability, performance, how it feels in general. In general when it comes to riding the X300 let's put it onto the uh, onto the um, street first. It's uh, perfectly uh, fine. It can do highways per perfectly fine. It can do uh, city riding pretty good. And um, what powers this bike is a 294, 298 uh, parallel twin, double, head, double overhead camshaft, liquid cool, the whole shebang. Now, when I say it's good for the street, it's pretty obvious because the X300 despite how it looks is actually using a Ninja 300 engine a Ninja 300 being you know an entry level or in our country's case a mid-level uh, sport bike so while the engine is of course tuned uh, a bit on the lower end to give more power on the lower end compared to a, a Ninja 300 it's still the same engine and uh, you, you can tell that regardless of how it looks it's not really the best kind of um, off-road vehicle that you would want in an adventure bike now when i when i talk about how the engine performs usually it's you know the the, the engine tops out red lines at fifteen thousand rpms but you tend to have to drag the bike up to about eight to nine thousand rpm to feel the power start to kick in and anything below that it's quite mellow I mean it's pretty even across the, the board even when you bring it to 8,000, 9,000 rpm and, and, and get the, the, the full power the most efficient uh, power of, from the bike uh, but uh, it's still quite mellow that's why when I look at this as an off-road bike I don't see it it's it's probably going to bring you across uh, you know, uh, a long trip uh, across Malaysia to, to let's say a long gravel path, dirt path along the kampongs but in general I would not bring it anywhere like what Motor Track does on uh, log climbs, boulder climbs and all that sort of thing. So when you bring it into a situation where you climb loose terrain uphill uh, this is where the bike really um, falls short. The, it definitely does have enough power to, 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 to climb up, but it does require a lot of uh, momentum. So you need a, a huge runway before you make the climb. And when you are doing it, it has to be you know in, in, in first gear. There's not much torque between the 1 to 5,000 RPM range, uh, which I kind of like in single cylinder thumpers but I digress because this is not a single cylinder thumper it's not a, a dual sport like a DRZ or KLR it is a small adventure bike along the lines of its bigger brothers like the BMW uh, 750 and uh, 1200 GS or, or the ones from KDM 1190s Rideability wise I'd say the X300 is a very light bike uh, despite of course, its pedigree being an adventure bike, it's a very light bike. Uh, it's very flickable on the streets, uh, easy to, to, to pick up if you, you, you drop it on a gravel trail. Uh, in general, a very maneuverable bike, 
Although when it comes to, of course, CD writing uh, or single track, this is uh, not a great bike to have compared to a real dual sport or KLR. It's going to be just as cumbersome as a 1200GS on single track. So that's uh, not a, a good bike to, to bring if you are very off-road focused. And uh, you, as you can see, most of the parts later, which I'm going to show you is more biased towards the, the road than off the road. As far as comfort is concerned, I like the X300. X300 is very comfortable. It has a very low seat height. So for most people, especially ladies uh, in Asia, where they are slightly vertically challenged, uh, that want to get into adventure riding, X300 is great because the seat height is low. Uh, ground clearance isn't amazing but it also aids in putting the feet on the ground when you need to do uh, 360 turns. A uh, very good little option there to have. The seat itself is soft, you know, a, a soft plush curved banana seat and the foot packs are also, also very, very comfortable being rubber which I will point out later why it's great for comfort and uh, on the road but not on off-road. Handlebars, pretty high, uh, pretty comfortable, very standard neutral position. I tend, because I tend to come from a sport bike background uh, the past few years, so I, I kind of tend to over lean forward, but this bike, if you want comfort, is very good on the spine. You get a very nice wide open uh, stance with your arms. On the legs, there's a lot of space, even if you're a tall rider, this is a very comfortable bike no matter your height you know if you're a tall rider you get a lot of space if you're a short rider you get something that is actually rideable in the adventure bike market so right now i'm going to be going through the other little bits and bobs on the bike individually and we will cover that as uh, i go as i go through the bike <laughs> start with uh, talking about the you know the obvious options that came stock on the bike now the the side panniers of course and of course these uh, hand guards they are stock on the X300 they come like this from the factory so it's a little nice touch and a little nice gesture to have but I believe they are only stock on a 2018 for the both of them I I think the 2017 and 2019, they don't come with this too. But, you know, it's nice to have, but not necessary. The little uh, boxes here, I'm not sure. I think they are about 20 something liters combined, 24 liters combined. Uh, not exactly a, a nice shape either because it's this uh, little, you know, bubble shape. Looks like an hourglass. So technically you can only fit pretty much a square item about this thick uh, per box not a, a, a great option so if you are somebody that tours longer on uh, with and requires more stuff you might want to get something new anyway and the stock hand guards well obviously look at that it's plastic it's garbage they are a nice thing to have if you are touring on the road they are great against snow they are great against uh, you know, road debris, great against uh, rain, you know, all these things. Anybody that rides adventure, you know, long trips across the country, they know these things hurt a lot and it's a must have to have hand guards. But where it falls short is, is that this arc is crappy plastic. It's not even a full, you know, uh, you know full uh, hand guard that that connects between the end of the grip with a metal bar to the handlebars and then you know protects your 
your hands when you smack into a tree. So off-road, these things are practically useless. Then you come to the next highlight. The Versus X300 does come with two uh, uh, fog lights that are standard on the bike. So the, the, the main headlights, they are standard halogen yellow light, but the fog lights are LEDs. Now the LEDs, I, they are great to have uh, on, on long rides through the night, you know, in uh, unlit roads, but uh, it's not the best uh, fog lights that you can get. It's good enough for, you know, uh, moonlit, starlit nights in places like Malaysia, along the, along the uh, highways, but once you get into maybe rural dirt roads that connect, between the kampongs in the uh, rural parts of Malaysia and the sort of that light, uh, it kind of uh, falls short. It's not enough light. So it's great to have, but not substantial. And then one more thing is how flimsy the housing is. Uh, if you do take it off-road, uh, these fog lights are gonna smash into something and they're going to break off very easily. Uh, a good thing is that it's mounted in a pretty secure location along this nice to have uh, crash bars that protect most of your uh, top fairings. So the way it's positioned generally prevents it from hitting the ground unless you are of course riding off-road on uneven terrain. Now we, we come to the foot packs. Of course, as you can see, these are rubber foot packs and they're not even the optional, you know, the ones where you can remove the rubber bungs to reveal toothed foot packs. These are great. These are great for, for CD riding. Uh, however, they are a bit of a problem if you want to go off-road. Now, a lot of uh, really good dual sports, like for example, my DRZ, for example, and I think KLRs do that. The stock foot packs all come with removable rubber bunks so, so that you know you can remove them and have a toothed portion where you can grip the, the, the foot pack with your boots even though they are muddy. And anybody that goes off-road for any length of time in general will know that your boots will eventually get all muddy and they will tend to slip a lot if you are using this kind of rubber foot packs. So another minus point for being an off-road capable bike. Then over here, as you can see, this is not a bash plate. This is just a plastic cover. The X300 does not come with stock bash plates, unlike some bikes like the 800 GS, for example, I think uh, some of the more high-end bikes have stock bash plates. Even the DRZ KLR, which are dual sports and in a totally different category, uh, they have a minimalistic bash plate. It's not enough, of course, most people just throw away the, the stock bash plate, but at least it's something. But on the <laughs> Versus X300, there's totally nothing there. So anybody that wants to go off-road for any length of time needs to straight away buy a bash plate and these plastic covers only serve to make it more annoying because you have to remove something to add something else on. Now let's talk about the tires. The wheels in general, front is 190 19 inch, rear is 130 80 17 inch. Now the wheels themselves are pretty good, solid. Uh, alloy wheels spoked which I like for off-road and uh, I like to have in general off-road because uh, they do provide a bit more rigidity to uh, you know I mean a bit more solid uh, wheels that are less likely to break when you land but um, 1917 wheels while they are pretty standard amongst adventure bikes and of course they do perform decently enough off-road they are not going to be very good on this particular bike because of the ground clearance the, the bike has only about seven inches of ground clearance um, and having you know 1917 wheels probably costs the bike itself uh, maybe an extra inch or two of ground clearance which would have helped 
So definitely a gravel only bike or you know dirt paths, no no lock climbing and the the sort. Uh, 1917 rears of this particular size also tends to be uh, a problem if you guys want to look for you know tire options that are more towards the off-road portion of uh, riding so they might not provide a lot of uh, options uh, they are good enough but I think I think they are they are enough enough, but not not a great selection in general. Now the tires are trail winners, as you can see the trail winners. They are great for road riding, as usually most uh, stock tires go. Uh, most adventure bikes, the stock tires, they are not meant for off road use. They are more for road, so. I'm not surprised, uh, but the trail winners do tend to be a bit more of the lower quality side of things. Uh, it's pretty good on the road, uh, does uh, perform well in the dry, but tends to be a bit squirrely in, in the rain, as you can see today. Uh, decent if riding slow in gravel uh, might cause you to, to slip out in gravel if you are going a bit faster and you, and you brake. Uh, one more complaint I have is the brakes are pretty good. They are very decent, nice, good, solid grip if you're on the road. But there is ABS on the bike, front and back. And the problem with the Vsys X300's ABS system is that it is 100% not disableable. If that is a word, you can't disable ABS. So while ABS, as most people know, great to have on the roads, not so great if you are riding off-road because uh, when you are going up or down a slope, especially on loose terrain, uh, it's pretty obvious the wheels will definitely lock up. And when you want, when you brake, you do want to lock up the wheels so that the tires will drag along the surface of the, the trail as it goes down to create you know resistance but if abs is constantly kicking in while you're going down the slope you're never going to be able to brake you just pretty much roll down the slope and it depends on how steep it is it might be a huge problem uh, so in general i would say i would never ever take this on anything other than simple gravel paths now suspension wise a 5.1 inch travel telescopic front rear is 5.8 inches of travel uh, very good uh, and soft suspension stock uh, for my 80 kilo frame it's got pretty a uh, decent uh, rebound setting stock so uh, on on the road it's very maneuverable, maneuverable and uh, comfortable at the same time. Uh, off the road, it might require a bit of setting, but the problem is that it's not uh, adjustable. These forks are not adjustable, might need better forks in general. Also, the 5.1 and 5.8 inch travel is abysmal, but it's hard to say because for one thing, yes, Compared to its larger cousins like the 1200 GS and the 1190 Adventure, uh, who have I think anywhere between seven to eight inches or something even nine inches of travel stock, uh, those bikes are heavy. So while they have generous amounts of suspension travel, most of the suspension travel is put into actually supporting the weight of the bike. Whereas on the Versus X300, yes. Uh, on, on paper, the suspension travel is kind of mediocre, but you kind of understand that the bike is light, there's not much weight you really need to support other than the, the rider and the luggage that goes on top of it. So uh, it could be good, it could be bad. I have not really gotten myself in a situation where I'm actually bottoming out the forks, the suspension in general. Uh, so I can't say whether whether uh, it's enough or not. But I can say that as far as uh, light gravel riding, uh, light uh, dirt riding, this occasional pothole, it can handle those things very well.
Now for the dash, dash is very good. Uh, of course, there is going to be a power outlet here, stock built in. Then of course, here is your um, on-off button for the hazard lights. I mean, not the hazard lights, the fog lights. Okay, so over here, there is a hazard light button. Great to have, I love it. Uh, nowadays, Kawasaki uh, is putting hazard lights on almost all their bikes, even the small ones. The highlight of this is the dash. I like the way the dash is set up. This is the exact same dash that's used on the Ninja 650, uh, where you get, you know, a lot of information, uh, oil uh, levels, uh, temperature, fuel gauge, then uh, your trip uh, meter, uh, digital speedometer, and then of course the most important thing that a lot of us uh, look out for, which is your fuel consumption. And then I like the fact that they still maintain a standard old school uh, tachometer instead of the ones in a lot of newer sport bikes. I just like seeing a needle spin around and then of course a clock and your gear selector. The tank is a 17 litre behemoth uh, and of course the bike itself does, as you can see just now as I showed you, anywhere between 22 at, at the lower end if you are only riding in the city to 24 if you are like me mixed riding uh, and if you do 100% highway, probably 26, 28 even. Uh, but you are more likely to expect about 24 kilometers to a liter on this particular bike. Final part of uh, the review is probably the windshield. Uh, a lot of people really forget to review the windshield. The windshield itself, I don't particularly like. Number one, first of all, it's not adjustable. Number two, it's small. So in general, this is a pretty pathetic windshield for the average, you know, uh, long distance rider. It's decent enough if you just want to travel between a uh, trailhead to trailhead. But obviously, as I said before, this bike is not uh, for you to go between trails. It's decent, uh, but generally not enough for on the road touring. So, end of the day, the story is, for me, I think the Kawasaki versus X300 is a decent bike on the road. It could have been better for off-road users, but apparently it really does fall short as an off-road bike. Uh, it, obviously, it does handle off-road perfectly well. It probably does handle off-road better than its bigger cousins, the 650 uh, versus but the thing is it tries to portray itself as a, a as a true adventure bike something along the lines of those 1190 adventures but it doesn't really have the same capabilities as those bikes in general so it's a great touring bike if you plan to do um, maybe 90 percent road with 10 percent uh, gravel and uh, dirt trails that connect uh, uh, little villages uh, little towns they are relatively flat. This bike is perfectly fine. But if you are somebody who thinks adventure bike means uh, climbing through single and double track, uh, going up and down uh, slopes with loose gravel and loose terrain, then obviously this isn't the bike for you. Uh, although it does, it is able to manage, but with a bit of modification to it, generally speaking. 